president of the Board of Trustees of Antioch University of Santa Barbara. And it's my great privilege and pleasure to welcome you this evening to the talk by Professor Lawrence Tribe, the distinguished constitutional scholar from Harvard Law School. Professor Tribe's talk is an important and most welcome contribution to Antioch University's ongoing In Conversation series, brought to you tonight in partnership with the Santa Barbara Bar Association and the Legal Aid Society. Thank you for your partnership. As soon as these two groups heard the, the title of Professor Tribe's new book, Uncertain Justice, the Roberts Court and the Constitution, some of their members, trained in the law, nodded sagely and vigorously while some looked querulous. They all agreed they wouldn't want to miss this evening and I wouldn't want to miss it either. I have an advantage over most of you. I have read the book. <laughs> Whatever preconceptions you may have, tonight you should leave them at the door. Pres Professor Tribe and Joshua Matz, his partner who is sitting in the front row, have written a stunningly original, deeply analytical, fully researched, and cogently presented, and most of all, to my mind, an impeccably fair-minded and penetrating book that has changed the way I think about the Supreme Court and the nine justices. I will be surprised if your reaction is any different. Before we begin, begin, there are several people I would like to introduce who have contributed greatly to this evening's event. I want to express my very personal appreciation for Dr. Nancy Leffert, president of Antioch University Santa Barbara, for her extraordinary leadership and for her amazing public support, uh, support for these public dialogues that are carried out by our trustees. Nancy, would you please stand so we can give you a little <laughs> add a girl. She's as wild and woolly as her red hair. I also want to thank the Honorable Susan Rose, who has taken an important leadership role in these initiatives. And I want to thank Scott Campbell, uh, president of the Santa Barbara Bar Association, and Molara Vadnais of the Legal Aid Society, and our own team of Kimberly Downs and Barbara Greenleaf. We want to thank Mary Shelton of Tecolote Bookstore from Montecito, who's handling the books tonight, and she will uh, help you purchase them with her customary kindness and calm efficiency. She and Professor Tribe will meet you after this talk, along with Joshua Matz, out on the patio, which is stage left. Uh, Mary says that if there are more requests for books than we have books on hand tonight, she will take orders and you will get a signed copy in the mail. We also want to remind you, especially of those you who are interested in justice, uncertain or otherwise, that there are only 159 shopping days until Christmas. To properly introduce Professor Tribe tonight, we are very privileged to have Morgan Chu, a distinguished lawyer and currently president of the Governing Board of Overseers of Harvard University. I want Mr. Chu to know that if we continue to have events like this, so keenly anticipated and widely supported by you, the community, it is my hope that someday Harvard will be known as the Antioch of the East. <laughs> After professor, uh, the professor's opening remarks, Mr. Chu will engage with an, in a discussion with him, but most importantly, we invite you to ask questions. We have microphones down front, as Vanna White would do, like this, and there'll be someone to help you. So it's now my great pleasure to invite, invite to the stage Mr. Chu and Professor Tribe. Thank you, Jenny. Thank you very much. I have the great pleasure of introducing Professor Lawrence Tribe. And he is going to discuss with all of us his book, Uncertain Justice, and a variety of other subjects. But there is one thing where the word uncertain does not apply. 
it is certain that Larry Tribe is the preeminent constitutional scholar of our time, period. <laughs> Larry has quite an interesting background. He was not born with a silver spoon. He was the first member of his family to attend college. He was born in Shanghai, China to Russian Jewish refugees shortly before Pearl Harbor. Japan, of course, occupied a great deal of China, including Shanghai, and Larry's father, who had spent a little bit of time in California and obtained U.S. citizenship, was imprisoned by the Japanese as an al enemy alien. He was, after several years, released from prison, and then the family moved to San Francisco, California, to Golden Mountain, I suppose. Larry was five and a half years old. He attended public schools there. And I dare say he was a prodigy from day one. By age 16, he was a National Merit Scholar. He was admitted to Harvard and then proceeded to embark on a career in mathematics. He graduated uh, summa cum laude from Harvard College in mathematics. And later, later, I'm going to ask you whether there's been inflation in the Harvard Honors, because today, today, with inflation for the Harvard Honors, I think only 5% of the folks attending Harvard College graduate summa. And I understand back then it was a smaller, much smaller percentage, so that those who graduated summa was actually just a handful of people. He then clerked for Justice Matthew Tobriner, who was one of the towering judges and justices in the United States. He was on the California Supreme Court. And after that, for Justice Potter Stewart of the United States Supreme Court. He then made a small detour and worked at the National Academy of Sciences, uh, worked on some science things. Maybe we'll have time to uh, have you address your interest in science and mathematics and other areas. And after that, by the ripe age of age 27, he joined the Harvard Law faculty and spent all of three years before he became a tenured faculty member. He is now a Harvard University professor. Now, what does that mean? It is with a big capital U because there are only a tiny handful of current professors at Harvard who have chairs as university professors. Indeed, if you go back over time, over roughly 375 years of the history of Harvard University, there have been 70 university professors. And one nice thing is one of them is still with us today. <laughs> Larry has written over 100 books and articles. He has argued more cases before the United States Supreme Court of any other living advocate, putting aside those who are em employed by the United States government where their job is to argue cases before the United States Supreme Court. And he's argued some truly landmark cases. About half the work he does on legal cases is pro bono. He was heavily involved in the new constitution for Czechoslovakia, or for the Czech Republic, excuse me. And he also was involved in the constitution uh, for South Africa. He is more than a scholar and a brilliant legal mind. He's a compassionate human being, and I've had the honor of knowing him for a number of decades, and I'm so proud to be on the stage with him today. So welcome, Professor Tribe. Thank you so much, Morgan, for that much too generous introduction. It's something that I, I'm sure my, my mom would have believed. <laughs> uh, 
and my father would have at least liked. <laughs> I want to thank David Rintels and Vicki Riskin, wonderful humanitarian activists and leaders of the artistic community in Southern California and nationally who have become close friends of mine and Elizabeth's in an amazingly uh, short time. I'm sure some of you remember Kenny Rogers' great song, You Can't Make Old Friends. Well, David and Vicki have become Elizabeth's and my old friends so soon that they provide a dramatic counterexample. And I want to thank Antioch University of Santa Barbara, the Santa Barbara Bar, and everyone who has made this possible. And above all, I want to thank all of you uh, for, for being here. Um, I co-authored the book that you've come to hear about with the best research associate that I've had in many years, Joshua Matz. I've been really, really fortunate, not only in you know, surviving Shanghai and getting here. I mean, my whole life has been luck. But I've been amazingly fortunate in the research associates and students that I've worked with during my 45 years of teaching at Harvard. 45 years, hard for me to believe. When I first started teaching at Harvard and I knew someone had taught there for 45 years, I used to say, can they possibly still be alive? <laughs> uh, but here I am. The people I have taught and worked with have included leaders of the bar and philanthropists like Morgan Chu, he was a student of mine, Justice Elena Kagan, Chief Justice John Roberts, a fellow you may have heard of named Barack Obama, <laughs> lots of other prominent public figures who have dedicated themselves to some form or another of public service. Now, I'm not saying my co-author Joshua Matz will necessarily reach similar heights, but don't put it past him. Next year, he will be clerking for Justice Anthony Kennedy, and I would say the sky is the limit for Joshua. Uh, this summer, another of my terrific research associates, a law student named Max, Max Rosen, went home to New Hampshire and spent some time talking with his high school music teacher. Their conversation began with her asking, what's up with all these 5-4 decisions? Is the court becoming just another polarized body mired in partisan politics, broken, no longer worthy of universal respect? Shouldn't I be worried? Well, Max told her to read his law professor's book, Uncertain Justice, if she wanted to get an answer that might surprise her. Love that loyalty. Max was great. In all seriousness, he had just finished reading the book for the first time, and despite the typical law student's cynicism, he had been inspired to see things in a much more interesting and encouraging way. In technicolor instead of black and white, viewing the justices in several dimensions instead of seeing them as flat cardboard caricatures, easily labeled, depending on which side of the political spectrum you're on, as the good guys, the bad guys. I put the good guys on the right, but some people would say the good guys, the bad guys and one swing justice named Kennedy. As liberal versus conservative, left versus right, activist versus originalist. Well, uncertain justice explains the decisions of the justices as not at all reflecting those polarities. It explains them as reflecting the interplay of nine powerful personalities and intellects with nine sets of worldviews based on nine distinct sets of personal histories, bringing about often shifting coalitions around a fascinating and diverse array of principles for interpreting our constitution and laws and for understanding our national history. I wrote the book with Joshua as an antidote to all of the misplaced certitudes about the Supreme Court. Not to bury the court, as some people do. There are a lot of books that trash this court. Or to praise it. There are some books, not as many, that are designed to show that we have the greatest and best Supreme Court anybody could ever want. But to bring it to life for people who actually care about understanding and not simply reaffirming their initial prejudices about what makes sense and what makes the court tick. Now, I haven't had time to circle back to Max's music teacher, but 
I hope she took his advice and read the book because I did intend it in Joshua as well. As much for music teachers and landscape gardeners, doctors and grocers and small business owners as for judges and law students and lawyers and law professors. I didn't dumb anything down or talk down to people, but I also didn't dress things up in the legal jargon that makes so much of this stuff impenetrable. I mean, it turns out that using lots of technical terms is often a way of covering up the fact that you don't really understand what's going on. And I say that with all respect about some of my smartest colleagues at Harvard and throughout the country. So that's why I was so gratified that Doris Kearns Goodwin gave the book a shout out, calling it a joy to read from start to finish, filled with memorable stories and striking references to literature, baseball, and popular culture. I was pleased that Jeff Tubin called it a brilliantly insightful and engaging, indispensable and fair-minded guide to the court's recent history and, more importantly, to its future. And that Ted Olson, with whom I've sparred more than a few times in the Supreme Court, called it penetrating and highly readable, superb and even-handed. And I didn't even have to pay them a lot <laughs> to get them to say that. Doris Goodwin's blurb mentioned baseball, and Max's music teacher is an avid baseball fan, so he told her a little bit about how baseball figures in the book, and you might wonder about that, so let me say a couple of words about it. You may remember John Roberts' confirmation hearing testimony about how he would try to be just like a good umpire, only calling the balls and strikes and not making up the rules. He said people don't go to a game to watch the umpire. They go to watch the pitcher and the batter, and that's not what I want to be. Well, that's both right and wrong. It's right in the sense that good judges, like good umpires, don't bend the rules to favor their preferred team, make sure that the team they like brings home the pennant. They do exercise a substantial amount of subjective judgment in interpreting the rules and implementing them. One umpire famously described the strike zone as a living, breathing document. <laughs> Besides that, the book shows how and why Supreme Court justices have to make the rules of constitutional law. Unlike umpires who don't really make up the rules, Supreme Court justices can't simply apply the rules fairly and even-handedly because the rules aren't written down. Yes, the Constitution is written down, but it uses words like due process of law, equal protection of the laws, liberty, even the recess appointments clause, which is highly technical, is subject to differing interpretations, as we saw in a decision yesterday where all nine justices held that President Obama had violated that clause when he made certain recess appointments, but they had two dramatically different theories about it so that although the decision looked unanimous, the future is going to depend very much on how the different views within the court shake out. Well, after one of my book talks, an umpire named Daryl came up to me to make sure I knew about his favorite rule of baseball. It's rule 9.04C. Let me read it to you, it's quite short. The umpire in chief shall have the authority to rule on any situation not covered in these rules. <laughs> Pretty well described <laughs> what the Chief Justice and the Chief Justice's eight associates have to do in all the cases that are difficult enough to make it to the Supreme Court out of the 8,000 or so that seek the court's attention, only 70 make it to the court to be heard in full and argued and decided on the merits. So that rule of baseball is a perfect metaphor for what the Chief Justice and all nine of them have to do often. That does bring to mind this Wednesday's, that is yesterday's, dramatic, well, it's Wednesday, yesterday, I've been going back and forth around the country, I can't even tell what it is. This is Friday, right? A couple of days ago, the court held in Riley v. California, on behalf of all nine justices, that our cell phones cannot be searched without a warrant, 
except in real emergencies, even if we happen to have them on us when we're stopped or arrested. And it turns out that cell phones are almost like a part of the human anatomy. The vast majority of people have their cell phone within five feet, 90% of the time, counting day and night. Writing for eight of the nine justices, Alito concurred separately, Roberts politely noted the absence of, quote, precise guidance from the founding era, <laughs> unquote. An understatement if ever there was one. He proceeded to look to the American Revolution, the values we fought for, the way those values were enshrined in the general terms of the Fourth Amendment, prohibiting unreasonable searches and seizures. In fact, one of the things he said was quite interesting. He said, and this is something that James Madison and his buddies would have found hard to understand, the term cell phone is itself misleading shorthand. Many of these devices are in fact mini computers that also happen to have the capacity to be used as a telephone. They could just as easily be called cameras, video players, Rolodexes, calendars. They would have understood calendars tape recorders, libraries, diaries, albums, televisions, maps, or newspapers. Sort of reminds me of one of my favorite New Yorker cartoons. It shows this guy going into, you know, cartoons and jokes often start with two guys going to a bar. Well, this guy went up to a genius bar in an Apple store, and he said, yes, it's all very nice, but do you have one of those old things where you can just telephone somebody to have a conversation? That's what he was looking for. Well, giving the lie to claims that the justices are a bunch of old fuddy-duddies who are clueless about the ins and outs of modern technology, Roberts wrote a sophisticated opinion about microcomputers, encryption, remote wiping, Faraday bags, social media, and how the phrase, there's an app for that, has found its way into the popular lexicon. He said, for everything from sharing prayer requests to improving your sex life. Not a peep was heard from Justices Scalia or Thomas about the original meaning of the Constitution back in 1791. Speaking of which, some of the most amusing and telling debates that we describe within the court about originalism are between Scalia and Alito, not between supposed liberals and supposed conservatives. For instance, in the oral argument of the recent case about marketing violent interactive video games to kids without parental consent, Alito told one of the lawyers arguing before the court, I think what Justice Scalia wants to know is what James Madison thought about video games. <laughs> did, he en did he enjoy them? I think Alito is getting under Scalia's skin a little bit. We'll see. And in the court's several opinions in the unanimous ruling that following a car around for a month with a GPS attached to its underside by the FBI amounts to a search and thus has to meet Fourth Amendment standards, Alito mocked Scalia's attempt to draw an analogy between GPS tracking to the 1791 scenario of, and I quote from Scalia, a constable hiding in a coach for weeks to monitor the owner's movements. See, he's very creative. He can think of something that might have happened way back then that wasn't exactly the same, but raised similar issues. Well, in his concurring opinion, Alito wrote, something like this might have occurred in 1791, but it would have required either a gigantic coach, a very tiny constable, or both not to mention a constable with incredible fortitude and patience. Well, a lot, of the, a lot of the book's stories are selected to explode the myth that the justices can be neatly divided into liberal and conservative camps. There is, for example, the story of how Arizona's show me your papers, anti-immigrant law, that the court struck down five to three in 2012, Kagan was recused. Story about that in which Kennedy wrote a poetic opinion for the majority celebrating our national identity as a land of immigrants, 
yearning to breathe free. And he was joined by Ginsburg, Breyer, and Sotomayor, all Democratic appointees, all widely celebrated as progressives and liberals, and by Chief Justice Roberts, widely regarded to be conservative. Another example of division within the ranks of each supposed camp is the court's decision striking down government regulation of practices that steer doctors toward prescribing costlier medications. The vote was six to three, with the generally liberal Justice Sotomayor writing for the court, striking down that regulation. She was joined by Roberts, Scalia, Kennedy, Thomas, and Alito. Breyer, in dissent, was joined by Ginsburg and Kagan. He issued what has come to be known as a Lochner alert. There was a decision in the early 20th century called Lochner v. New York that symbolized the Supreme Court's role in striking down one economic regulation after another, both state and federal, when those regulations were designed to protect consumers and to protect workers. And Breyer and those who joined him warned that the majority led by Sotomayor was returning to what he sort of thought was a kind of Neanderthal era in which the court used all kinds of constitutional theories to block progressive legislation. Just a few weeks ago, the generally progressive Justice Breyer joined Robert Scalia, Kennedy, Thomas, and Alito in allowing Michigan voters to ban all uses of race-sensitive affirmative action. And he did it over a remarkable dissent by Sotomayor, joined by Ginsburg. So the close divisions often defy partisan and political and ideological stereotypes. Now, I'd make a more general point, and I don't want to go on too long because I really want to have a chance to have a conversation with Morgan and, and with you, but I'd make a more general point about the imaginary upsurge in closely divided, seemingly ideological rulings and the supposed passing of a golden age of consensus on the court. It turns out that the percentage of rulings that are unanimous has been going up, not down, while the percentage that are 5-4 has held quite steady. During the years when William Rehnquist was Chief Justice, it was about 20%. During the years nine so far that Roberts is Chief Justice, it's higher, 20.1%, not noticeably. Gradually, the percentage has crept up. It was around 3% before World War II. It climbed to around 10% during the years when Harlan Fisk Stone was Chief Justice. See, he had been Dean of Columbia Law School, one of these academic types who wanted it all to hang out. He didn't think that differences of view among the justices should be suppressed. Then it doubled to 20% under Rehnquist. But much of that is an optical illusion because strong chief justices often persuade their colleagues to keep their differences to themselves in key cases, to present a unified face to the public. So when people think, God, look at all this division, what's up with these five, four decisions? The fact is, nothing much is up. The cases are hard, the issues are difficult, the issues are ones that divide the American public on how best to deal with race, how to balance free speech and abortion. All of those issues naturally attract division. And it's a question of whether the Chief Justice manages to cover up that division in order to present a unified face. We had a bunch of unanimous votes recently. The cell phone privacy case on Wednesday was unanimous. The case protecting freedom of speech near abortion clinics was unanimous, although the justices differed dramatically on how they got to their conclusion in a way that will have real implications for the future, the kind of thing that Joshua's and my book makes it easier for people to understand and look for. The decision invalidating President Obama's recess appointments to the NLRB was unanimous. But again, the court was split five to four on what the rule should be for recess appointments and how you think about them. And of course, the justices aren't there forever. Some people think they're there longer than they should be, but they're not there forever. Life has a way of moving on. 
and the future is inherently uncertain. Anyway, unanimity is not necessarily a great thing. Sometimes it just covers stuff up. I tend to agree in the abortion clinic case with Justice Scalia who wrote, I prefer not to take part in the assembling of an apparent but specious unanimity. Dahlia Lithwick, some of you know her writing in Slate, she's terrific, has named it phonimity, a term that I've called snettier, which means snarkier, better, and neater than merely specious unanimity. Well, let me close with something that I guess people come to these book talks for. I understand that some people come to these events sort of expecting that the author will read something from the book to give them a flavor of what they're missing if they don't buy it and stand in line to get it autographed. So let me read just the first couple of paragraphs from the start of the chapter called Freedom of Speech, Sex, Lies, and Video Games. Very short. Throughout the 1960s, the justices of the Supreme Court spent at least one day each year in the basement watching porn together. <laughs> By all accounts, it was fantastically awkward. Unable to define obscenity, but convinced that the First Amendment couldn't protect it, the court was forced to create constitutional law one sex scene at a time. The films ranged from scientific documentaries to the improbable escapades of lesbian nymphomaniacs. Justice Thurgood Marshall, the great civil rights hero, took merciless pleasure in narrating the clips for the special benefit of Justice John Marshall Harlan II, an elegant former Wall Street lawyer who was by then losing his eyesight. So he would say, look, oh, John, look at that. What, what, look what he's doing. Look what she's doing. <laughs> Mocking Justice Potter Stewart's insistence that I know it when I see it, even if I can't define it. Clerks would call out in the dark, I see it, I see it. <laughs> in 1968, about 20 years after serving in the United States Navy, a still youthful Potter Stewart reflected on more adventurous times and confided in a particularly curious clerk, me, that he had indeed seen it. See, I don't say me in the book. That's why you're here. You're learning a little bit that isn't it. <laughs> but there's a footnote that says me, that he had indeed seen it just once off the coast of Algiers. <laughs> I still don't know, and I couldn't get him to tell me what it was that he had seen off the coast of Algiers. <laughs> Thank you all very, very much. <laughs> Larry, having heard that little lecture, can we sell the book now? <laughs> <laughs> well, you've mentioned that the President of the United States, Barack Obama, is a former student. Chief Justice John Roberts is a former student, and there was an occasion on Inauguration Day where all of the United States was watching the two men together, swearing in President Obama for his first term of office. You must have been so proud. What was going through your mind? Well, I was hoping that they won't flub it. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I was proud. I thought it was cool. Um, but then they flubbed it. I mean, you, you must remember that, that John Roberts, who had decided to do it without notes, um, got the oath wrong. And Barack Obama tried in his answers to correct him, but he kind of got the corrections wrong. So late that night, I got a call from another of my former students who was working in the White House. Do you think we should have a do-over? <laughs> you know, if they don't believe his birth certificate, God... <laughs> what are they going to believe about a guy who didn't really take the oath? <laughs> so I th but on the other hand, you know, if we have a do-over and make it public, that's going to cause some bad PR. You don't want the first day of the president to be, the president had to write on the board, I, Barack Obama, do. <laughs> uh, I suggested, yes, a do-over, and I'm sure they would have done it with or without my advice. So they did it over. 
They didn't have another inauguration. <laughs> they, just, they just did it in the, in the East Room, I think. And every day since then, at the beginning of your constitutional law class, do you teach the oath of office? <laughs> <laughs> I didn't then, and I don't now. I, I have to admit, you know, it's right in there. I, I make sure everybody has a copy of the Constitution, but memorizing it uh, isn't the name of the game. I mean, you can, you can look stuff up, but it usually is not as precise as the oath. The, the only oath that the Constitution prescribes in so many words is the oath that the president must take. And it's got some other little precise things in it, like the president has to be 35. But for the rest, it's pretty much like the strike zone, definitely a living, breathing thing. Now, we have a very interesting society in the United States in the last 5, 10, 15 years or, or more because if a book or an article is said to be even-handed, that often comes out of the mouth of someone who's being a critic of that book. Mm -hmm. And some of the critics of your and Mr. Matz's book have said, well, it's just too even-handed. Right. So right. let me ask you a very specific question. There's uh, an important Supreme Court decision, Citizens United, in a moment I'm going to ask you to provide a synopsis of it because I'll end up flubbing it. And Citizens United is a very important case in terms of campaign finance law. And after the decision, and I think it was almost immediately after the decision, President Obama quite openly was critical of it. Your former colleague at the Harvard Law School, formerly Professor Elizabeth Warren, now Senator Elizabeth Warren, has also been incredibly critical of it. So could you describe very briefly what the decision was and your view of the decision? Sure. I mean, it's hard to be happy about any decision in a long line of decisions that generally help people with lots of money, not only corporations, but George Soros, the Koch brothers, Nelson Adelson, um, that enable them to use that money to get more access to politicians at every level uh, and to influence them. I mean, it, you have to be so naive that you haven't lived on this planet not to believe that these people think they're getting something for their money. You know, they don't always succeed. We know that uh, Eric Cantor spent twice as much as David Bratt, a lovely last name, uh, as David Bratt trying to get elected, and, and it didn't work. But it's still, on the whole, kind of screwy and creepy. That said, what the Supreme Court did in Citizens United uh, is not suddenly discover that corporations were people. Oh my God, look at that person walking down the street. I mean, corporations don't love, they don't make love, they don't cry, they don't, uh, they don't have feelings. We'll learn Monday whether they have religion or not. But the point about <laughs> Citizens United, uh, and the Supreme Court did say way back in the 1890s that although corporations aren't people in the usual sense, they're things people put together to get stuff done and there are constitutional protections to which they're entitled. The government can't take their money away or take their property away without just compensation. But the gist of Citizens United wasn't really about the speech rights of corporations. It was about the danger of letting the government decide who could and who could not spend how much influencing the political process. You know, the limits on corporate spending or on the spending of the wealthy, either on individual candidates or cumulatively, don't sort of come from the heavens. They are written by politicians, the very same people that many of the critics of Citizens United think have been bought and paid for already. So the solution of having the Supreme Court not look closely at the government's exercise of power when people who have been influenced by money are writing the rules that might, for all we know, be cleverly designed to keep them in office and make it harder for challenges to be brought. Not a very good solution. And what the court was saying wasn't that corporations have special rights. It was that the First Amendment protects speech, not speakers. And it doesn't matter who the speaker is, 
the listener has a right not to have the government play the role of censor. So that if, for example, E.T. or some more horrendous alien figure were to arrive in a spaceship in the middle of Santa Barbara tomorrow, and the government of California said, we don't want them influencing the people of Santa Barbara. This creature from outer space can't vote. Not only don't they cry and have babies, they can't even vote. Why should they be allowed to influence the people? We're going to shut them down. We're going to censor them. I guarantee you that the Supreme Court would say it violates the First Amendment to have the government censor this thing, even if it's not a real person. So in the end, uncomfortable though it makes me, I think Citizens United was rightly decided. Most of my liberal friends are freaked out by that. <laughs> yeah, I bet more of you would clap if I said it was wrongly decided, because <laughs> Citizens United, <laughs> right, see? But the point of the book is be open-minded. Look at the arguments. Even if in the end you conclude that you were right, you will at least have gotten there after hearing seriously what the other side thinks and how it feels and where it's coming from. And that's the point of the book. It's no big deal to have views about these decisions and keep those views sealed up, but especially in an internet age, we have such an easy time reading and hearing and listening only to those things we like. Some people listen only to Fox and they hear what they want to hear. Some people listen only to MSNBC and that validates their views. But we're not going to be a very healthy country if people only listen to those who are preaching to the choir, whichever side of the choir you may be on. So I happen to think it was probably right. But I'm open-minded enough so that I'm not, you know, I don't think for all time nobody could possibly change my mind. This book is not designed to either praise or bury the court. It's designed to help people think better about it and recognize what a, what a happy and joyful trip it can be to really understand it better. Let me ask a question about another very important decision by the Supreme Court, and it has to do with the Affordable Care Act, otherwise known as Obamacare, and there are a lot of different provisions in that piece of legislation. And one key provision was the individual mandate. And that's where many people on different sides of the aisle, different factions of politics seem to clash. And I believe that most pundits thought that the conservatives would clearly come out against that uh, upholding that particular provision and that they seem to, in issues of that kind, hold a 5-4 majority. And the battle was over a particular constitutional provision, the Commerce Clause. Uh, and there was, in the government's brief, trying to uphold that portion of the statute, just a little throwaway secondary argument about the power of the United States to tax. Now, it's very tricky business trying to predict what the Supreme Court's going to do. People do it, but you stuck your neck out before the decision came down, and what was your prediction, and how well did you do? Well, I don't always do as well as I happen to do that time, but uh, my prediction, I made it on television both before the oral argument and after, uh, based on what I know about John Roberts and about his philosophy, and based on listening to the argument, uh, was that he would agree with Scalia and Thomas and Alito um, to some extent. He would agree with Kennedy and those other three that Congress did not have the power under the Commerce Clause, the clause that says Congress can regulate commerce, to force people, commandeer them, into entering commerce, into buying an insurance policy. But I was predicting that he would say, although Congress can't force them to buy it, it can give them a choice. It can say either buy insurance or if you don't buy insurance because you might end up in an emergency room costing the rest of us a bunch of money and costing taxpayers money and raising premiums, your alternative if you don't buy it is to pay a slightly increased income tax. It's your choice. You're not going to be an outlaw if you don't buy the insurance. 
and he got the government lawyer, the Solicitor General, in the oral argument, to kind of go along with that. He said, so you're not going to consider the people who don't buy insurance uh, scoff laws, outlaws? No, no, sir, no, Mr. Chief Justice. So it seemed to me absolutely plain after that argument. Well, I, I wouldn't say absolutely plain, 90% clear that that's what Roberts would do. He would say, this is not the government using a club to make people do something. It's just saying, if you don't do it, you better pay into the kitty some of the costs you impose by not doing it. Now, people thought I was crazy. Rush Limbaugh went on the air and said, this guy doesn't belong at Harvard. He belongs in a loony bin. <laughs> uh, this is not plausible. And I was right. I yeah. actually thought that Rush Limbaugh said, you did belong at Harvard. <laughs> <laughs> A matter of your definition <laughs> of loony bin, right? <laughs> Very good. Touche, touche, Morgan. <laughs> See why he was such a good student? <laughs> I want to ask some questions about the structure of decision making at the highest level in terms of our justice system. For a long time, perhaps uh, throughout the history of the United States, depending on what one's point of view was for the issues of the day, you either loved or hated the Supreme Court. So I'll give you an example. Uh, Roosevelt didn't like the Supreme Court, and he came up with a plan to pack the court, add some new justices so he could appoint some new justices and change what the outcome of decisions would be. And by the way, I'm referring to the Democratic Roosevelt, not the Republican Roosevelt. Do you think that the justices should have life tenure? I don't think they should. I think they should have fixed, non-renewable terms, probably 18 years or so. And I think it should be staggered so that every president, after a while, once this is going, would have two appointments. So we don't have the phenomenon of somebody like FDR, although he got to do it because presidents weren't term limited yet. We don't have the phenomenon of one president projecting his vision of how the Constitution should be viewed decades and decades into the future without limit. When life tenure was put in place, essentially not to make this a great perk, but in order to ensure the independence of the judges. We don't want the judges just to do what they think is popular. When that was put in place, people tended to die off much earlier. Now people seemingly live forever. And there's a real problem with that in the view of some, and probably it would take a constitutional amendment, very hard to get, two-thirds of the House, two-thirds of the Senate, three-fourths of the state legislatures to achieve it. Something that may work even without an amendment would be a statute simply saying that the Constitution guarantees to those people who are named to the court that they will be judges of the federal judiciary forever until they die. It doesn't guarantee that they will sit on every case in the Supreme Court. Maybe they have to be assigned to lower courts after they've been on the U.S. Supreme Court for 18 years. So that just like O'Connor and Stevens and Souter, who retired from the court, haven't retired from the federal judiciary, that would be a kind of tweak. But if there's anything that's as hard as getting an amendment these days, it's getting Congress to do anything. Because, of course, it only takes a majority, supposedly, not two-thirds, the way an amendment does. But when you've got the filibuster, which has been removed only for executive and lower judicial appointments, not for Supreme Court appointments, and not for legislation, when you've got the filibuster, it's very hard to get legislation of this sort through. So I think for the foreseeable future, we're kind of stuck with having life terms. That means that we have to pay even more attention to what sort of person is being named the judiciary and what sort of values does somebody have who's being elected president or elected to the Senate because that's the one place where we, the people, can have a real voice in the selection of those people in whom we repose the power to interpret our most fundamental law and understand our values and history as a nation. It's easier said than done because pocketbook issues and whether we should do anything in the Ukraine or Iraq and issues of an immediate sort tend to flood 
public attention when presidential elections occur. And it may be a pipe dream to think that people would pay the kind of attention to who is being put on the court that I would like to see. So we go through this kabuki dance. We have these you know, kind of meaningless confirmation hearings where Roberts can say, yeah, I want to be an umpire calling the balls and strikes. And Elena Kagan can amuse the world by saying, where was I last Christmas? Well, at a Chinese restaurant, like all good Jews. Uh, it's all, all very funny. They know how to be amusing. They know how to not answer questions. We don't learn anything. We should pay more attention to what they wrote as their high school term paper than we do to how they answer questions when they are prepped by the White House. It is learn what their view of the world is, how, how they see things, and what sort of character they have. That's why I would think someone like Sonia Sotomayor, who has such a profound understanding of what life is like for ordinary people, uh, I think would run that gauntlet very well. And some other justices not to be named might not run it quite so well. I learned during Justice Kagan's confirmation hearing that I'm Jewish. <laughs> because at Christmas time, we had Chinese food and went to the movies. <laughs> <laughs> And my parents and aunts and uncles, they played mahjong. <laughs> <laughs> See, Elena has something for everyone. <laughs> <laughs> so thinking about the structure of, of the Supreme Court and where we are today, is there any special importance for the next six years? And I'm picking six purposely because it's two more years until the next presidential election cycle and then four more for the first term of the next president. And at the end of the next six years, many of the justices will be in their 80s. And we are likely to have a substantial amount of turnover. A number of justices are not likely to leave the court while a Hillary Clinton is president <laughs> because they're not going to want to be replaced by someone more like Breyer and Sotomayor and Kagan. Now, that's kind of a paradox because I've just spent some time telling you, and if you read the book, I think you will understand why I deeply believe that all of those stereotypes are a little bit wrong. I mean, you know, uh, people like Stevens, a good Republican, antitrust lawyer appointed by Ford, Souter, a very serious traditionalist, a good Republican appointed by George Bush. A lot of the people don't end up quite where the president expects them to be, but still, people on the court tend to time their resignations in terms of thinking that those that bring them to the dance are, ought to be the ones who figure out who should take the next turn. And in fact, that's not an improper thing to do. When somebody once asked Chief Justice Rehnquist whether it was appropriate for a justice to time his or her resignation with a view to who gets to sit on the court next, he said, I think that's perfectly appropriate because resignation is not a judicial act. I think that's pretty serious. That is, it's not appropriate to think when you vote as a justice, will this help the party that I want win? So that when the court upheld in a decision by Justice Stevens, who's often quite progressive on things, when it upheld pretty serious voter ID laws in a case a few years ago, I think it would have been surely wrong for any justice to think, hmm, let's see, is this going to help Democrats more or Republicans more? And I hope none of them thought that way. Um, but that's quite different from paying attention to politics when you decide to leave a lifetime post. Because you don't want your legacy to be ripped apart by your successor. I want to stay with the system for just a while longer. Up until Justice Kagan joined the court, there were a number of people who observed there were commonalities among the justices because I believe they all, for a sustained period of time, all or nearly all, had been judges on the courts of appeals. Right, the sort of and the farm team, the that, federal circuit right. courts. And let's add to that, if we go back to 1992 and coming forward in terms of the White House, and let's just assume someone who's thought of as a leading candidate for the presidency in 2016. Of course, it is Hillary Clinton. Let's assume for the moment, hypothetically, she was elected, but it could obviously be someone else. If she is and served two terms, you would have 20 
four out of 32 years of lawyers occupying the White House, and you would have 24 years where either the first lady or the first man or whatever his title might end up be also being a lawyer. Do we have too many lawyers? And I say that against the background where some of my best friends are lawyers. So it's partially a, a question about the structure of the court. Do they have too much in terms of common backgrounds? And it's a broader question about government when you have the White House, at least in recent times, being dominated by lawyers. And indeed, if Mitt Romney had won, he's a lawyer as well and a graduate of the Harvard Law right, School. Right. Is that too much? Well, you know, given the prevalence of lawyer jokes, I think most people would assume it's too much. The, the <laughs> one of the best of those, and I have a few in the book, is, uh, you know, if you've got a lawyer with sand all the way up to his neck, what have you got? Too little sand. Right? <laughs> no, I, I think law, law is sometimes overrated, or just like Lily Tomlin said, reality might be a little bit overrated. That said, being a lawyer is at least one important thing about being a good justice. That is, justices are not simply automatons just reading the laws, but legal judgment is necessarily involved. But you do need more diversity in background than just a background in law. That is, if you ask, not only was Elena Kagan the only member of the court when she joined it who hadn't been a judge before, the others were all judges and all in the US courts of appeals, and in fact now all nine are graduates of either Harvard or Yale, except you could count Ruth Ginsburg as sort of a graduate of Columbia. She moved from Harvard to Columbia at one point. I've got nothing against Harvard. I like it. It's been good to me. I've got nothing against Yale either. But surely there are other law schools in the country. <laughs> you know, <laughs> UC, Texas, other schools. And besides that, why should they all be principally legal practitioners and legal theorists? Either academics, the way Breyer was, the way Kagan was, the way Scalia was or judges the way all of them except for Kagan. Look at the court that decided Brown versus Board of Education. By almost any account, the greatest decision of the 20th century, and a decision whose current status is a little shaky, not that they'd overrule Brown, but that the promise of Brown is very much up in the air. Look at the judges who decided that. Earl Warren, Attorney General of California, Governor of California, Hugo Black, senator from Alabama, William O. Douglas, professor from Yale, but also head of the SEC. These people had real life experience. They had experience running government, being governors, being senators, not just being theorists. They knew a lot more about life, and that's important, because although it's important to be a lawyer to make these decisions, it's important to have some grounding because it makes a difference how you understand what makes things work, what makes things workable, what affects people in one way or another. And when you have a group of nine people, not one of which has ever faced the American public to earn the right to exercise power, to be accountable to the public, none of them ever run for office, not even dog catcher, I think something is missing. And I think that's why Clinton was wise to try at least to persuade Mario Cuomo at one point to accept a position on the court. He said no. I bet he regrets it now, but he said no. What's your proudest achievement? Probably my two children and therefore my four grandkids. I mean, you know, I still remember their birth in a way that, that seared into my memory as though it was yesterday, even though one of them is now 41 and one is almost 50. I can't believe it. I thought when I was 50, I was over the hill. <laughs> <laughs> That's my proudest achievement. And how about professionally? What's your proudest achievement? I think all the students that I've had, probably. I mean, it, it, it's like having lots of children. Uh, not to suggest that, that you're not mature, but all the people that I... <laughs> 
that I get to know as students are people who, who are Who is always, my mom? <laughs> they're, all, they're always, they're, they're a bunch of kids to me. I love seeing them, you know, spread their wings and fly. But I still remember Barack Obama as a tall, skinny kid with a funny name sitting on the floor of my office in jeans and a sweatshirt and having long conversations with me. And I am proud of what Wait, he's Why don't you tell that story? So how did you first meet President Obama? Well, he wasn't President <laughs> Obama then. How did you first meet this yeah, it was like tall, skinny kid with jeans? <laughs> um, it was March something or other, and I've got it at home. I still I keep, you know, although I use the iPhone and the iPad and all that, I have these desk calendars in which I scribble stuff, and I've got them going back to the late 1960s, and I have one for March 1989, and in the lower right corner, it has the words Barack Obama misspelled, exclamation point, and then I have his dorm phone number. Um, and I still remember he came around to my office, and I don't always write the names of, I mean, the, you know, these calendars aren't very big. You can't write everybody's name, but this kid blew my mind. He came around. He was a first-year law student. He hadn't yet studied constitutional law. But he came around, and he said, I, I know a little bit about your work, and I would love to spend a little time talking to you, if you don't mind. And I thought, sure. Um, and we had a conversation, and it went on for hours, and I was really blown away. I mean, this kid was brilliant. He was charismatic. He was thoughtful. He saw all sides of everything, maybe too many sides of some things, but he was the real deal. And I asked him if he wanted to do some research for me, and then he ended up being my principal research assistant for a couple of years. He worked with me on an article called um, the curvature of constitutional space, what lawyers can learn from modern physics. And there was a lot of stuff in there about quantum theory and about Einstein's general theory of relativity. And Barack had to learn, I mean, I knew some of that stuff before, but he had to learn a lot of stuff in a very little time in order to digest it and help me think through what the lessons of that were for legal thought. And he was just magnificent. Then he worked with me on another book uh, called Abortion, the Clash of Absolutes, and he took another course with me in a seminar, so I, I got to know the mind of this kid pretty well. Um, that's how I met him. I didn't know the story that he had worked with you on the Curvature article, um, and if I'm remembering correctly, the way your recent book ends, it makes a reference to the arc of justice. And that was also a phrase uh, originally from Martin Luther King, or at least Martin Luther right. King uh, it. popularized it, but also uh, candidate Obama used it quite a bit. Right. And what does it mean to you, and what were you trying to communicate at the very end of your book? Well, Joshua and I went back and forth over and over and over again with whether we should say, insert the word hopefully, or not into that sentence about the arc of justice bending, the, the moral arc of history bending toward justice. And I think we both felt great when we decided we could take out the word hopefully. Hope could be implicit. What it meant for me was the sense that, that we, we live in a world of infinite possibility. Things don't have to go downhill forever. The pendulum can swing. There's every reason to have faith in the possibilities of the future. For somebody like me who managed to get here over all kinds of odds, that's sort of built into the fabric of the way I see the world. I, I see it even if there's only a little water in the glass. It's a tenth full and not nine tenths empty. And Barack was a lot like that. I mean, he, the, one of the other things he said a lot about during the campaign, and he said it since, he loves the preamble of the Constitution and its phrase, in order to make a more perfect union. It's always reaching towards something better. I mean, it took a civil war to erase, and it didn't fully erase, the stain and the obscenity of slavery in our history. But in my view, right did prevail. And although none of us will be here to see how it all turns out, because this country, I think, is going to last a very long time. I think the moral arc of history bends toward justice. It's simply an article of faith. And hey, what can you lose by 
thinking that. It's sort of a lot better than being a pessimist. Now, not only did you have the article about curvature and use the word physics, but you also have had law articles that use the word math or mathematics. Could you explain that? Yeah, well, I used to be a kind of mathematician. I mean, you had a wonderful and very positive summary of my, my background. I did a lot of abstract math about algebraic topology and algebraic number theory. Um, and I continue to believe it's the most beautiful discipline aesthetically that I, that I know, these amazing insights into the structure of things that you can get simply through the power of this, you know, pound and a half of gray matter inside your brain. But it bothers me when people abuse it. And when I was clerking for Matthew Tobriner, we had this case that was very strange in which um, there was a woman with a pigtail and a guy with a beard and a yellow convertible and a couple of other facts. And all people knew about who had robbed this bank was it looked like, and they were interracial, it looked like an interracial couple man with a beard, yellow convertible, woman with a pigtail, and some prosecutor puts a statistician on the stand to testify that the odds are infinitesimal that this couple on trial, which has those characteristics, isn't the guilty couple. He said, look, how many women have a pigtail? One out of three, all right. How many men have a beard? One out of two. Multiply one out of three times one out of two. How many cars are yellow convertible? He gets this astronomical multiplication thing, and he says the odds that this is a, the wrong couple are just one in a million, so you should convict. And I immediately saw there were zillions of fallacies in that way of doing it, but people sometimes get dazzled by mathematics. It looks so precise, it looks so you know, clean, you can always put a QED at the end of it. So I helped Matthew Tobriner, and he helped Ray Sullivan, his colleague who ended up writing the opinion, write a decision about why this was an abuse of the trial process. And so when I got to Harvard, my first major article for the tenure effort was called Trial by Mathematics, Pre Precision and Ritual in the Trial Process. Um, you know, I wanted to write about something that I knew something about because I was relatively young and I didn't know much about anything except what I had learned in law school and you had to do something impressive. And so I've written some stuff about how mathematics shouldn't be abused. Um, and I think that's the one you're talking about. Yes, yes. So I'm going to ask you a couple more questions, but I want everyone in the audience to get your minds going, thinking about questions that you would like to put to Professor Tribe, and then we'll begin to take those questions. Um, do you have a favorite amendment to the United States <laughs> Constitution? Stephen Colbert asked me that once. <laughs> he said, his, he right away said, my favorite is the 19th because it gives women the vote. And I said, I love the 19th, but my favorite is the 9th. He said, why the 9th Amendment? And he's great. I, I, I'm so sorry that he's not going to be in personality all the time in the future. But anyway, I said the 9th Amendment I like because it says that the Constitution is incomplete. It's like the arc of justice, it's really like the rule of baseball. The Ninth Amendment says that just because some right hasn't been written down in the Constitution, that doesn't mean it isn't protected by the Constitution. So the right to think whatever you want isn't mentioned in the Constitution, but we all agree that it's protected. And I love the idea that the Constitution is not a complete, exhaustive laundry list. That it's legitimate, and that the Constitution tells us it's legitimate to look at other ways of figuring out what rights people have. And of course, that was a little too serious answer for him, and he made fun of it somehow. And I was warned that you don't try to, you know, you don't try to one-up Stephen Colbert. So I, I just laughed. and. He laughed, and there we were. But that's my favorite amendment. Very good. What about your favorite case that you championed before the United States Supreme Court? Which case? Probably was my first. The case where a woman had been murdered, and her apparent killer had been convicted, and then the conviction had been overturned. And then there was a mistrial, and 
family, the, the victims, the living victims of this murder, really wanted to watch the trials. But then suddenly a deal was made between the prosecution, the judge, and the accused that said, we're going to close the courtroom, kick everyone out, and in a closed deal, the judge suddenly acquits this guy. You know, and the people whose mom had been killed didn't even get to see it, let alone the whole world seeing it. And the Richmond newspapers wanted to cover it. They had been excluded, and they asked me, they didn't know I'd never argued a Supreme Court case, and I wasn't about to tell them. Uh, they asked me if I would agree to represent them in the US Supreme Court. And it was sort of a challenging case, because the court had recently, before that, held that the press and the public have no right to be at certain kinds of trial proceedings, except when the defendant wants them there. It's part of his right to a public trial. And this defendant didn't want the press there. So you couldn't even use the First Amendment quite to say that the press and the public had a right to be there because the First Amendment doesn't give you the right to make someone open their records to you. It just says if someone speaks you and wants you to hear what they're saying, you have a right to listen. But it doesn't give you a right to peek into a proceeding where none of the people there want you to hear. It, it's like I... I my saying, I'd like to see your diary, Morgan, and you'd say uh, no. And but I'll show you my cell phone. Okay, <laughs> all right. But, you know, so I figured that the Ninth Amendment would help. That is the traditional right of the press and the public to watch justice done. That was critical. Now, Floyd Abrams and the standard First Amendment lawyers said, don't mention the Ninth Amendment. That's never figured in a Supreme Court case. Don't mention it's like a dirty word. Just rely on the First Amendment. And I said, no, I'll, I'll talk about the First, but to the extent that the First Amendment doesn't apply here, I'm going to lean on the Ninth. It hadn't yet become my favorite, but it was when the opinion by Chief Justice Berger relied on the Ninth Amendment in part, in substantial part, saying this right may not be fully protected by the First Amendment, but Hell, it's protected by the Ninth Amendment. And I was a little more elegant than that, but that, that, was, that was a very satisfying victory. I felt good for the victims, and I felt good for the future. Because in that case, called Richmond Newspapers Against Virginia, the court established that the press and the public have a right to attend trials. One other thing I loved about that case was the fact that the judge gave this weirdo excuse for excluding the public. He said, this courtroom is not designed to have the public here. It's just not appropriate. And I thought, what's that about? So I, I found out a little bit about the courtroom. It was near Hanover, Virginia. And I amazingly came upon this picture in the National Gallery of Patrick Henry delivering a magnificent oration. And people were hanging in from the rafters. And it was in this very courthouse. So I included that as an appendix to the brief. It made me feel especially good. I just want to <laughs> note the, the symmetry. You and Joshua Matz did a book about the nine justices on the Supreme Court after Justice Roberts' nine years uh, as mm -hmm. Chief Justice of the Supreme Court. And we have nine chapters. Nine chapters, and your favorite amendment is the wow. Ninth Amendment. I think we've got to get an astrologist in there. <laughs> <laughs> with, with that, uh, questions from the audience. Thank you for this uh, talk. As a veteran, I want to thank you for your uh, amicus brief when you joined the ACLU to try and force the VA uh, to provide uh, housing and services in uh, Los Angeles. Uh, my question is, uh, to use your baseball now, it's a little out of left field. I'm just wondering if there might not be an opportunity to use the Second Amendment to increase gun control. Mm -hmm. By that I mean we have the phrase about the well-regulated militia. On the other hand, we have what in Heller the court has said is you know, a personal right to uh, bear arms. The NRA, the gun lobby, in my mind are trying to strike a line item veto on the Second Amendment by doing everything they can to dilute the bit about well-regulated. You know, if you have a well-regulated militia, it's to uh, keep good order and discipline. So if you have two clauses, 
separated only by a comma, how can you treat one as a mandate, the personal right to have to bear arms, and not give equal weight to the well-regulated bit? So might there not be an opportunity to argue that laws that dilute the government's ability or law enforcement's ability to well-regulate gun ownership, is there a chance to argue that those laws like um, the loophole that allows uh, gun shows to mm -hmm. sell weapons without background checks are, in fact, unconstitutional. Sure. Let me, let me answer that by beginning with an anecdote that I tell in, in the book. When, in about the year 2000, when I was writing another edition of my sort of opus on the Constitution, I kind of sheepishly admitted, I put it in a four-page long, 800-word footnote, I think, or whatever, <laughs> that, you know, I think, despite the well-regulated militia language, that there's a powerful case to be made for the fact that the Second Amendment protects not only the state militia, but individuals. And most of my friends were aghast. And there was an article on the front page of the New York Times saying, tribe supports individual rights view of Second Amendment. I also said that I thought that, like other rights, it could be regulated and partly I relied on the well-regulated militia language, as your question suggests, and partly on other arguments. But somehow, Charlton Heston, who was then the head of the NRA, didn't read that part of the memo. Uh, so I get this call after the front page story comes out from Charlton Heston. Professor Tribe, I have a private plane out here at Logan. I have a private island I would like to show you, and we can talk about our joint interests. <laughs> I thought, oh, 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 shit. <laughs> uh, not exactly what I wanted to hear, so I said, well, Mr. Heston, I'm a great admirer, particularly of, and I couldn't think of anything else, particularly of Planet of the Apes. <laughs> but, but I'm not sure we're entirely on the same team here, because I believe in strong regulation, and then he hung up and I never heard from him again. <laughs> I think the part of the Ninth Amendment, ironically, that can most powerfully be used in support of gun control broadly defined is the way the court treats it as a self-defense right rather than a militia right. Mm -hmm. After all, if the Ninth Amendment, I see Freudian <laughs> slip, if the Second Amendment is really about self-defense of the individual and not only about the militia, then what about defending yourself against these armed thugs and the people who go into shopping centers and auditoriums like this and churches and mm -hmm. other places armed to the gills, carrying weapons that endanger you? What about people who visit you at home with weapons? What about your own weapons that might be grabbed by somebody else? These statistics show that more people who have guns for self-defense are killed by those guns than actually use them to kill an intruder. Maybe the right of self-defense is symmetrical and includes a right to be defended from guns as well as to use guns for your defense. And Although it's a little hard in a book that is designed to be for everybody to make that kind of argument easily understandable, I think we succeeded in doing that in our, in our guns chapter. Um, and in fact, there are all kinds of cases in lower courts percolating around. Some communities have passed laws requiring everyone mm -hmm. to have a gun. The way the Congress did in the 1790s, all able-bodied men had to have guns at home. But one way of attacking those laws that say you must have a gun is to say that having a gun at home endangers my life. My choice for self-defense is not having a gun that might be, you know, unlocked at some point, that might be stolen by an intruder. And so the arguments about self-defense can cut both ways. Thank you. And I, in case you're not familiar with the minutia of uh, California law, if E.T. were to land, he might not be able to vote, but he probably could get a driver's license. <laughs> <laughs> and maybe a gun license. Uh, to be symmetrical and even-handed, I noticed there's a microphone on...
the left side and the right side of the theater. So let's go to the right side. Thank you. Uh, with regard to the rule of nine, I would point out there are also nine innings in baseball. I'm sorry, you, you would point out that? There are also nine innings in baseball. Oh, yeah. Well, sometimes it ends before that, but you've got to have all nine innings in order to have a real no-hitter. This is true. You're a mathematician. <laughs> um, thank you for talking about Citizens United, and I'm interested in your idea that the main concern is the power of government to actually regulate speech. And obviously, it's permitted to in certain circumstances. There's time and place restrictions. Um, but the biggest concern that I had in the opinion would, and pointed out by Stevens is the concern is traditionally been, and I think since the Tillman Act, either actual corruption, money can actually corrupt politicians, or there would be a perception of corruption. And the Supreme Court, in the majority opinion, if I recall, said, no, there can't. No, there isn't. There's, there won't be. And yet, I think, in analyzing the McCain-Feingold and in, in coming to the regulations, they had, they had looked at the evidence and they had actually fa had made factual findings on the issue. So they the court substituted its opinion about the facts. That seemed somewhat renegade. Well, I, in our chapter on Citizens United, which is subtitled Follow the Money, we are critical of the degree to which the court in a cavalier statement said that corruption has to be, you know, direct exchange. I give you the money and you give me a job or you vote for my bill. That in fact, when the court said nobody would reasonably perceive that the system is corroded and corrupted by the role of big money, it was going on uh, out on a limb that it wasn't, you know, the limb broke. It wasn't very plausible, but it wasn't really necessary to its reasoning either. In fact, we don't always want the court to defer to government when government is regulating speech. One of the worst decisions in recent years, and we criticize it, is a case called uh, Human, a Humanitarian Law Project Against Holder, in which Congress sort of made findings that whenever people do anything to help a terrorist group, even if they're only helping the terrorist group to put down its guns and pick up plowshares, that is, even if they're trying to teach various groups in Peru and elsewhere that are on the terrorist list how to file petitions with the UN and how to use peaceful means of dispute resolution instead of violence, that that helps the group indirectly. And the court, in a closely divided opinion, said, you know, we don't have to look closely at that evidence. We'll simply take the government's word for it. And one of the good things about some of the court's recent decisions, some of its most controversial ones, is that it has been a little more demanding of the government when it comes to evidence. That is, one of, sure, there are conditions under which you can restrict speech, but you don't want the government to simply wave a magic wand, make findings about things, and then have the court defer to those findings when a value as basic as speech is, is at stake. But your point about Citizens United is one that we also share. Thank you. And one other quick one was you talked about the umpires are not allowed to change the rules. Uh, what about them certifying their own question? against rule number 14 that says you can only answer the question that's put before you? Well, the court often adds questions to cert petitions. That's kind of a red herring. The court often says, we think we can't answer this, really resolve this case without seeing it in its broader context. So that's not a matter of changing the rules. It's a matter of framing the dispute. You can criticize the court for doing that or not, but when the court did it in order to hold in MAP versus Ohio that illegally seized evidence couldn't be admitted. That wasn't one of the questions originally presented. Most people didn't mind, or at least unless the people were law and order types who thought that we shouldn't have an exclusionary rule. 
And when the court decided in a case called Stanley versus Georgia that you can't punish someone for reading material, even if it's obscene, and for possessing obscene material, even if the material could be prosecuted if it's in the open market, because that's thought control. The fact that they added the question on their own didn't bother too many people. I think we should be even-handed about this. So I think that the technical attacks on the court for teeing up cases in order to reach issues they want to reach uh, are attacks that we probably should make only if we're willing to make them across the board. All right, I, I will yield. I have many, many, many more questions, but I will yield. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> I have a question about your, uh, in your Citizens United case, too. Uh, you made the point of don't let the government play the role of censor. That that's a bad thing. So my question would be, uh, are names uh, like the Washington Redskins and the uh, Cleveland Indians and the Kansas City Chiefs and the Atlanta Braves, are those uh, legally defamatory or are those owners under the First Amendment allowed to use those names as a part of free, free speech in your opinion? Well, the court has been very careful to limit the use of defamation actions, actions by individuals or groups on the ground that a word or a slur injures a whole group. There was a famous case from Illinois called Beauharnais versus Illinois, where there were nasty statements, much nastier than just a name like the Redskins, made about whole racial groups. And the Supreme Court did say that if someone uses words that make an entire group stigmatized and subordinated, then the government can ban it. Now that decision most people think wouldn't come out the same way today because that too is a kind of thought control. I thought that the case in which there was a really powerful argument for giving people redress, not through a defamation action, but an action for intentional infliction of emotional distress, was a recent case in which this group called the Westboro Baptist Church went after soldiers who were being buried by their parents with these horrible signs saying, God hates fags. God hates the United States of America because it lets fags in the military. And this family that just wanted to bury their son brought a lawsuit against the church for intentional infliction of emotional distress. I thought that that was a pretty solid lawsuit. Eight to one, the court said, no, it violates the First Amendment. And the only one who said that to have meaningful discourse, you don't need to deprive people of the right to defend themselves against that kind of personal attack it was Justice Alito, which is quite interesting. But I think trying to sue the Redskins and say that your choice of that word is offensive to a number of people, so you better not use it, puts us or would put us on a very scary road. And I think if that case reached the Supreme Court, it would and should hold that for the government to give any group of Indians or others the ability to sue the Redskins for using that name uh, would violate the First Amendment. Thank you. It doesn't mean that it's a good thing for them to use it. It doesn't mean that it's good judgment. You know, a lot of rights that we have are not rights that a decent person would exercise. Um, you know the cell phone privacy case announced mm -hmm. last week? Um, it seems like the uh, majority opinion, the language from the majority opinion quoted um, over and over again in the media uh, seems to provide a virtual template of language in a future case to uh, abolish the NSA and NSA surveillance. Uh, am I dreaming or, 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 is there, or, or is there something or, or is there something to that to, to wit that the, that the language in the Fourth Amendment, is not optional, it's mandatory. You know, and that, 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 we, that I read we fought it, a revolution you know, about, about general warrants and things I like read that. it very much the same way that you did. That is, a lot of what Robert says is that the information the government can get from your cell phone is information about whom you called, not necessarily the content of the conversation, whom you called, where you visited, where you were, the GPS information, they can learn 
whole profile of your life that they can put together like a mosaic. And I thought, am I dreaming or is he describing the NSA's metadata program? Quite plausible that the, the court may have had that in mind. And even if it didn't, you can be sure that the briefs attacking that program will quote Roberts, who was writing really for the whole court. There is a difference. That is, in this case, there was no debate about whether there was a search. It wasn't like the GPS case, for example, in which the question was, when they stick a GPS on your car and all that does is figure out where you went for a month, is that a search? Here, the question was, given that it's a search, and it's a search of what you have on you when you're arrested, and given that there's an old doctrine that says when you arrest somebody, you can search the person, principally, I think, in order to protect yourself. So Robert said that the contents of a cell phone are not going to endanger the cop who arrests you. Given that doctrine, this was a search, and the only question was, is it an, the kind of search that requires a warrant to be reasonable? And the court said yes. In the NSA case, when they get the data from your information service provider, your ISP, AT&T, Verizon, Google, when they get the data, they're not searching you. They're searching third parties. And I think the court, unfortunately, and we talk about this case, decided in 1979 when the government stuck something that was called a pen register on your phone in order to learn whom you were calling. In that case, the court said, that's not a search because you have no reasonable expectation of privacy in the numbers you call. You've given those numbers to the phone company. Justice Stewart, I think, wisely dissented. Said, hell, you're giving the conversation to the phone company, too, if you want to be technical about it. That case, which basically said anything you reveal to somebody else, you're basically authorizing Big Brother to get. I think was a big mistake. And there was a nice indication in the majority opinion in the cell phone case, in Riley, Riley versus California, where the Chief Justice, in passing, talks about that case, Smith v. Maryland. Doesn't suggest that it should be reconsidered, but talks about how it was really limited to the particular little technology of the pen register. And in another case, the GPS case, Justice Sotomayor, who is a real powerhouse on the court, wrote a concurring opinion saying, one doctrine that I think we should reconsider, given modern technology, is this doctrine that information you give to a third party, whether through Facebook or through giving the data to your ISP, the doctrine that says that information is open for the world to search. You've given up your privacy in it. That needs to be reconsidered. I think that's what will be at issue when the court gets the NSA case in the next couple of years. So do you, do you think that this pretends that we're heading toward a unanimous abolition of the, uh, the NSA in the not future? Necessarily, or not necessarily. Not an abolition of the NSA. I mean, it does a lot of stuff. But holding that you need a specific warrant, yeah. whether from the FISA court or something else, again, it's not clear whether the court will treat that as a search or whether it will say the search occurs not when they collect the data, but when they dip into it. They may need a warrant to go after the particular data in the haystack. It'll be a, I don't think that one will be unanimous, partly because they are enamored of national security arguments. The case I mentioned to you, humanitarian law project against Holder, where they deferred to the finding that anything you do to help a terrorist entity helps it engage in terrorism, the court dealt with it in a more deferential way to government because national security was involved. And it's not just 9-11. Throughout its history, the court has been slightly spooked when the government says, you do that and you're going to kill a bunch of Americans. The court doesn't want the blood of a bunch of Americans on its hands. So that will also play into that case. Whereas in the cell phone case, they emphasize that there's no danger they t mentioned all these technologies by which the cops could prevent you from manipulating your cell phone from a distance after they get it. In other words, you can't use it to set off a bomb if they decommission it in various ways. So I think when the danger seems to the court to be great enough and hard enough to control, then all bets are off in terms of how they will strike the balance. 
Hello, Professor Tribe. My name is Tiffany Gouch. Um, I am better known as my, uh, through my artist name, Molasses Jones, and I'm very excited to meet you. Um, I've been beat up <laughs> legally by uh, some, some attorneys and uh, decided instead of just being an artist that I would form a media company based on um, the LGBT community, which I am a part of. Um, so Sweet Entertainment is now in existence, and I was just wondering, in order to, um, I guess, make a stronger company, um, I decided that I would go for a JD MBA, which I'm in currently in application for. And I was just wondering, would you choose, if you had limited resources, um, would you choose try and go for a Harvard, or would you just try and go for, you know, a local organization like Santa Barbara Colleges of Ventura Law and uh, Antioch for the MBA? These well, days, right now, right. the current economy, et cetera. I mean, I think getting a law degree might be helpful, and it matters more what you learn and where you learn it matters less. Um, and it's not a matter of money. I mean, Harvard gives scholarships to people. It's a matter of what your credentials look like and where you've got a good oh, chance. They're very good. Good. They're excellent. Well, then uh, the, sky, <laughs> the, the sky is the limit. You should, you should try for the... But you should have some safety schools. You shouldn't apply only to good places because, you know, great people, when you've got a huge number of applicants, great people sometimes just don't, don't make it. I think I'm, uh, I'm in the process of deciding that I'm going to stay local and build one of the, the greatest companies that is in existence. So, yeah. <laughs> thank you. Nice thank meeting you. you. If, if I might just add, add a plug, I think that Larry and, and I were great beneficiaries of a system that exists today in a very robust manner. If you're admitted to the Harvard Law School or Harvard College and other parts of Harvard, they will take care of you financially. And it's need blind admissions. It's a two-step process. They decide who to admit, and then if you need financial aid, you will get financial aid. Okay. That's partly because of people like Morgan, who have endowed chairs. Exactly. I mean, our dean is called the Morgan and Helen Chu Dean of Harvard Law School. Whoa. So, so you've I'll, done a lot of I'll be looking for you guys after this, <laughs> this meeting <Okay>. here. <laughs> Shoot. Okay, so um, I've been thinking with the recent decisions, or cases specifically, the GPS tracking and the cell phone um, cases, that the Constitution's uh, kind of become a bit antiquated, especially with how fast technology's been moving. And do you think um, it's time, like Th Thomas Jefferson thought, that we should write a new Constitution to kind of uh, conform to modern life? Or should I? I can answer that quickly. The answer is, it's not antiquated. Its provisions are very general, and these cases show how they can be adapted. And I'm worried that if we tried to write a specific one dealing with new technology, it would be much more likely to get antiquated. Because if we were to write it now, we'd, you know, we'd stick words in like Facebook and Twitter. <laughs> Thank you. Yep. Um, I'm glad I got a chance to ask this, because I think you'll enjoy the question. It's a little bit of inside baseball goes to the book. <laughs> Um, I remember reading a while back that when Sotomayor was being evaluated for confirmation, you wrote a letter to President Obama saying that, in not so many words, that you would greatly prefer to see Kagan nominated for the seat instead of Sotomayor. And, and you thought I'd enjoy this question? <laughs> <laughs> and, well, it's, the, the interesting part of the question for me is... is I thought, by the way, it was a confidential letter. <laughs> And I have apologized to Sotomayor. But you gave it to a third party. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> no, but the, the question portion is, is it seems that Sotomayor has, uh, like in the Jones case, built a reputation for taking some strong, very popular positions. But at least this term, and more recently, has been really criticized in footnotes, openly in cases, kind of for her legal reasoning, in a way that you know, from my experience, I haven't seen a justice kind of called out. I think even Kagan in a recent case, Roberts in a case, um, I remember her dissent in um, the affirmative action case was kind of a lone wolf, even though it should have been probably better championed. And I'm wondering what your thoughts are on her specific ability of a, as a justice 
given your previous thoughts and her body of work since? Well, when you read the book, I don't say if, but when you read the book, you will see <laughs> that she is one of our heroes. I mean, she has, in cases about criminal procedure and equality and other things, been not only a powerful, passionate voice, but a legal reasoner par excellence. The fact that occasionally people will criticize her is par for the course. I mean, Scalia was much more critical of Roberts in many cases than he's been of, of Sotomayor. He was remarkably critical of O'Connor. I can't think of anybody that he hasn't said <laughs> rather nasty things of. That's, that's the game. And then after that, they go to the opera together. I mean, Scalia and Ginsburg are at each other's throats, but they're great buddies. It's one of the cool things about the court. They, they are friends. Um, and after the, even after Bush v. Gore, for God's sake, the majority and the dissent really got along. And you have to. I mean, if you're there for life with a bunch of other people, you don't want to start making enemies. Now, some people think that by his acid tongue, Scalia has made enemies. It's not really true. They like him. They find him charming. I find him charming. <laughs> I find him charming, too. Thank you. <laughs> it up, and um, the people who have questions, I hope... Well, we've had such uniform gender thing. I mean, can we at least have one <laughs> okay. question from... one more, yeah, yeah. all right. <laughs> okay. Thank you for that, and thank you for being here. We often hear jurists and lawmakers criticized for relying on foreign or other civilizations. To what extent does the Supreme Court look to other civilizations, to what extent should they, and why are they criticized for it? Well, you know, when we had the Declaration of Independence, we talked about the good opinion of mankind. And until recently, we sort of assumed that the United States government is not alone. We're not an island in an, in an ocean. It's a, it's a global community, and more so now than ever before. So it really is bizarre that there's this xenophobic resistance to learning whatever we can from the way other countries do things. Several justices make a habit. Justice Ginsburg, Justice Kennedy, Justice Breyer uh, make a habit of saying, well, this is the way they do it. They share our value of decentralization, but they can achieve the values of federalism this way rather than that way. And several justices, get, like Scalia, get apoplectic saying, what do we care what they do? We've got our own American constitution. You know? <laughs> I think that's a mistake. I think we ought to look abroad. We're not bound by what other countries do. That would give up our sovereignty. But we can learn from them. And shutting your mind and eyes to anything that you can learn from, I think, is a mistake. Um. <laughs> This has been an absolutely spectacular in conversation with Larry Tribe and Morgan Chu. Thank you so much. Brilliant. And um, join us and stay tuned for our next in conversation at Antioch. Thank you.